Hey everybody, welcome to Hit Rewind. This episode is the final episode of the 1992 movies. Oh, what a journey we've been on. Oh, it's so fun. Most of the movies I have seen many times, I've given Jacob some new ones that are, I, I think, brand new to him, like Brain Donors and Noises Off and Out on a Limb. No, no, you've seen Noises Off. Out on a Limb was new. Yes, it was. But Michael, yes, I can't run as much cardio as I used to. This is a very long journey. What is this, fucking Lord of the Rings? <laughs> hey, <laughs> so was there any new ones for you on this journey? Okay, okay, it wasn't that bad, but I mean, it is summer. Okay. So it's a <laughs> but of the six movies that I gave to you, or five movies I gave to you this time, uh, were there any new ones to you? Uh, Shakes the Clown and Distinguished Gentleman and Hero. Oh, okay. So that was good. Um, the ones we couldn't get to, everybody, I uh, love Potion Number 9, Sister Act, Far and Away, and Honeymoon in Vegas, and Mo Money. We just ran out of time, and I don't want to keep going on and on forever. Um, so what's the first one you want to discuss from 1992? I wanted to get Hero out of the way real quick. Uh, again, I hadn't heard of this, but again, I always enjoy seeing Gina Davis. I think she was definitely, you know, very kick ass with what she did. She could play a reporter. And she didn't take shit. Yeah. It's, but, it was a huge flop. This... Being her boss... Go ahead. Being her boss, I'm like, I can, see, I can see that happening. He definitely pulled off that manipulative uh, boss role. Yeah. Chevy, we went against type too, and he didn't have his toupee, which is very strange for him. Oh, my God. He was... I didn't realize he was... I, was, I could never tell that he was wearing a pay. I thought he was always been balding. Yeah, well, I mean, on top, like, the front part, you could always tell. But in the back, he started going, like, in the early 80s. He started wearing a hairpiece. But, you know, he put on the glasses, he talks really fast, and he took off his toupee because he was sick and tired of playing the same kind of roles over and over. That's why he did um, Nothing But Trouble, This, and uh, Memoirs of the Invisible Man. Sadly, all three tanked. Yeah, no, I didn't realize. I didn't even, I've never even heard of Hero until now. I didn't think it was going to be probably that big of a movie. Yeah, uh, September of 92 was just riddled with bombs that were very expensive. There was The Public Eye with Joe Pesci, which is a 1940s, uh, he's like um, a photographer that does crime scenes. That tanked. There's Mr. Saturday Night with Billy Crystal, which is like the biography of a stand-up comedian. That tanked, and Hero was the big one. Though. This one cost like $45 million dollars. It's a love letter to old Frank Capra films of the 30s and 40s, and, you know, big cast, and just didn't make any money. Yeah, I know. Oh, God, I, was re I realized that little kid was, like, one of the lost boys from, uh, uh, Hook. Yeah. Hook, I think his name was. Yeah, it's... Oh, man. But, it's, yeah, that's one of the things I'll try, try to remember. And, yeah, watching uh, Dustin Hoffman pull off, like, this, like, kind of annoyed... But, you know, you know, quick-witted little scammer, <laughs> I mean, that was a little different for me. Yeah, it's, uh, he had taken some time off, I know, after Ishtar because it was such an embarrassment. And then Family Business didn't do very much money. And then he had that role in Dick Tracy, Mumbles. And I feel like there was a lot he took from Mumbles into this character. It's it's like this constant, like, jaw, uh, you know, flapping jaw, running the mouth, whatever, kind of skeevy kind of guy, which I think works really well for Dustin Hoffman. Yeah, no, it definitely did. I thought, like, <laughs> I like how it's like, yeah, no, he is a big, a big hero, but he doesn't want the credit, he doesn't want the name. I mean, of course, he's got a lot of, you know, baggage as well. You know, possibly going to jail for... What? what was it? Stealing a wallet, I think. Uh, he, there's so many crimes that he uh, did. Selling stolen items? Yeah. Oh, I'm a dumbass. Duh. Okay, this makes me sound film illiterate. I forgot. No. He he, he must have been kind of reflecting back on his Ratso Rizzo role from um, Urban... Not Urban Cowboy. Midnight Cowboy. Oh, okay. The movie I haven't seen in like 30 years. So but that's like, the one well, where he's like, yeah. he's, I'm walking <laughs> here. I'm walking here. <laughs> Yeah, but I think I think this is the one that really kind of damaged Andy Garcia's chances at really being a lead. It, it really, like, hit a break. And, and Gina Davidson didn't help either, but thankfully she had just come off of a league of her own, which made over $100 million. Oh, yeah, no, she was still hot. And, again, she was amazing in the league of her own. Yeah. 
This is a really good movie, I think, that's horribly underrated. It's a very specific tone. It's going to seem campy, but it's that way on purpose. There's certain camera angles and the way that they over-dramatize things, but it's on purpose. Oh, God, um, I'm trying to think of one particular scene that did over, uh, that did kind of overdo it. Oh, gosh, like the balcony scene where they're, <laughs> I mean, he's trying to talk Andy Garcia out of jumping. Yeah. But... <laughs> The, whole, the crazy thing is, yeah, June Davis, you know, and, you know, she mentioned like being a storyteller, you know, uh, for, especially from a reporter perspective. I mean, again, making up that whole thing where Justin Hoffman was blackmailing, um, oh, Andy Garcia. But it's like, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Like, again, you know, like, the thing is, that she came up that idea that he was like real is like no he took credit for what he did but I just don't want any of the limelight I do want some compensation though <laughs> <laughs> I'm because he left that dirty shoe in his car <laughs> I've never seen someone so um, bitterly helping people and it's like just bitching the whole time he's like I'm just trying to get this guy off the plane are you him are you him I shut up just keep going <laughs> <laughs> if you're fine get up move up <laughs> uh, oh man! What is our <laughs> second film? He's the one who ended up stealing Gina Davis' purse and trying to pawn that off too. <laughs> oh god! Yeah, no. Like I said, it definitely had its moments, but overall, I mean, like, eh, personally, I'm not sure if I can. I'm, I've had to be in the mood for it. Yeah. Um, what I haven't seen in 30 years, and I forgot, was so goddamn amazing. I mean, just jaw droppingly good. Is my cousin Vinny. Oh my God! Yes, <laughs> uh, especially Marissa Tomei. Yeah, it's just, like, it's... she was not just some like you know, sidearm stereotypical you know, good-looking mob girl, you know, with Joe Pesci. No, she knew her shit. Yeah, especially when it came to cars. And she made Lane Lane Smith look so stupid. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> has he ever been a good guy? Has he always been a, cu- a fucking tool? I feel like he always has been. Oh, that. Um, let's see. Uh, distinguished gentleman, yeah, and then Mighty Ducks. And then, well, he's well, he had a good 1992, but he's also in. Um, oh, I just had it in my head. Well, of course, he was in Lois and Clark for years, but he was in something else where he. Oh, uh, Son-in-Law. He, I guess he's not that bad in those last two things, but he was always kind of no because he was on the TV show V, and uh, he was helping the aliens, and he was such an a hole. Um, but I think, <laughs> I think, I think the most underrated oh, part of this Red Dawn. Oh, okay, yeah, you're right, right on, yeah, yeah. Um, Jonathan Lynn is a director that no one ever talks about when it comes to comedy. Um, I think he is a master at tone and rhythm. And uh, he's had so many bombs, though, that people kind of threw him away. But his first movie was Clue. I think it was Clue. But that, of course, it's a cult classic now, but at the time it came out, it bombed. Uh, He did Nuns on the Run four years later, which is a really funny movie. Then My Cousin Vinny, Greedy with Michael J. Fox, which I think is phenomenal. Uh, Sergeant Belko with Steve Martin, which I think is highly underrated. Uh, Trial and Jury, or Trial and Error? That's the one I can't remember very well. That's the one with Michael Richards and Jeff Daniels. Hmm, that one I haven't heard of. Yeah, it wasn't a hit. It had Charlize Theron in it. And then he did um, uh, the whole Nine Yards with Bruce Willis. I think that's what it's called. Um, So he had a hit here and there to keep him floating, but his his rat-a-tat-tat... Uh, way with dialogue and, and it makes things it, it comes perfectly in line in My Cousin Vinny because of the dialogue in the court it's, it works so well oh god yeah <laughs> I love especially when freaking oh god Joe Pesci was straight up um, at, you know his de- opening uh, defense argument <laughs> especially because he was in like the little uh, bellhop outfit after his suit got ruined oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> just, I wore this for you, I humiliated myself. You didn't like the leather jacket for a year. I love when he goes, "Oh, you were serious about that? <laughs> Are you trying to insult my court?" Oh, no. <laughs> Everything that guy just said was bullshit. <laughs> oh god! And I, oh, just like some of the youth that um. Oh god, I'm forgetting the judge's name. The actor that played him. Oh, Fred uh, Quinn. Munster. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, God, I would like how he would, like, try to, you know, repeat what Joe Pecky just said, 
So she would attend to saying the youth while you say the youths. <laughs> What's the a youth? <laughs> what does that mean, Mr. Gambini? <laughs> oh, the youth. What do you think? The young people. <laughs> what do you think are the two most memorable? I mean, what do you think is the most memorable line in this movie? Is it that, or is it? Oh yeah, you blend. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh I definitely want to say it was that uh, for me I'd say it was that definitely the youth part yeah and honestly you know growing up watching Karate Kid I always enjoyed watching Ralph Macchio so it was good to see him in another movie like that yeah I think this is right and, before and his big thing. retirement I don't recall him doing anything after my cousin Vinny for a very long time what he did with uh, the comedian Artie Lang yeah, that was like a decade later. The Beer League. I haven't seen that one, but yeah, that was like 10 years later. Maybe, no, maybe even 15. I don't know. Sure. It seems like it was a really long time. Yeah. I mean, Ralph Macho chose the quiet life, you know. I mean, I'm sure he was offered more roles, but he decided to, like, kick back and, you know, it was, you stay more family oriented. Yeah. I mean, well, I he, he got, that, he he got a first, huge uh, paycheck. He was interviewed after Cobra Kai premiered and gotten bigger. And, you know, he yeah. yeah, yeah admitted it's like yeah no of course I just decided to choose a quiet life you know I chose family and being oriented with that and he was set yeah but it is good to see him come back for Cobra Kai though um also I think oh I love that one particular scene where he's talking about like uh where he um where he did where he was mentored who he was mentored by like <laughs> and the, and the thing is though Marissa Tomei like you know after he tells the uh the judge that he was measured by some uh, Jerry Gallo, Marissa mentions to him, Marissa Tomei mentions to him, he's dead. You just gave him <laughs> a dead guy's name. And then all he did was just say, like, wait, Jerry Gallo, I know Jerry Gallo's dead, it's Jerry Callo. <laughs> <laughs> just by himself, like, time. Is a little bit of a pushover. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's so many scenes of like dialogue where he's slowly explaining himself or trying to get out of things, and I think this really works for Joe Pesci. Um, and I just I want to know why it is that after this he never had another successful solo film. Like yes, after this he was in Lethal Weapon three and Home Alone two, and that kind of put him in a higher class. But what ha what do you have after this? Jimmy Hollywood with honors, uh, eight heads in a duffel bag, gone fishing, all fucking tanked. I know, and I loved Eight Heads in the Double Pack. Oh, God, that one always made me laugh. Really? Do you have it? Because I got it at the dollar store. They, they have it on DVD at the dollar store. I got it. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, I don't have it, actually. Okay. <laughs> yeah, check out your Dollar General, or your Dollar Tree, whatever. They should have a copy for a buck. Yeah, no, I'll definitely have to look, for sure. But, man, um, yeah, again, overall, I can see why... Uh, wait, wasn't Marissa Tomei nominated? Yeah. For that part? She won. I knew she. I knew she wanted a an Oscar for something. And, and can you blame him? But she no. kicked ass in that role. Yeah, I, I think. She, I think she wasn't she like the underdog that year. Yeah, well, she was completely out of nowhere because before this, she was on the first season of A Different World, um, and got fired after the first season when they reconfigured the cast. And then she was in a pilot for a TV show that didn't go with um, Jeff Fahey from Joel Silver called Parker Kane. And she kind of plays a similar character as she does in this. And I'm guessing that's what the casting uh, director saw was her performance in Parker Kane and then got her for this. And this just blew her up. And she, she, well, she's still a, a big name. I mean, I mean, she's no longer really a lead, but she's great as Aunt May. The best Aunt May, honestly, in my opinion. I love Sally Field as Aunt May. Marissa Tomei. Yeah, Marissa Tomei. Yeah. Of course. And especially because they uh, drew inspiration from the Spider-Man video game where she's overseeing this uh, non-profit um, homeless shelter called Feet, and that was brought into the movie. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Also, there was another one she got nominated for. Oh yeah, The Wrestler with Mickey Moore. Was she in The Wrestler? Oh, okay. I thought it was for In the Bedroom yeah. that she got nominated. I didn't even remember her being in The Wrestler. Yeah. Oh wait, she was also in Chaplin too, remember? Very briefly. Yes, you're right. Okay, yes, yes. Um, you know what's funny is I keep thinking about the fact that Nicolas Cage turned down the wrestler and ended up saving, and I don't know how it didn't... Maybe Mickey Rourke's really hard to work with because I'm always shocked that that really only carried him for a couple of years. And after that, I mean, he was 
and he ended up being the villain in Iron Man 2. And Immortals. And then, that's, that's all I can remember. There was a couple other projects I think he'd been in, but I can't remember. Yeah. All right. Uh, another new one to you was Shakes the Clown, the demented, <laughs> the Citizen Kane of <laughs> drunken clown movies. <laughs> this fucking thing is dark, weird, and god damn it, it's hilarious. I know. I'm like, man, this is so brutal, but it's like, this is my like, this is some comedy I can definitely get behind. And, oh god, Tom Kenny was a scene stealer, and, oh gosh, Boink, whatever his stupid name was. I can't remember like now. He, yeah, seriously, like he was the one who set up Shakes. Um, well, after Shakes is already going through his own shit, you know, being alcoholic, screwing up things with his girl, and kind of ditching his friends, um, Sandler and uh, I forget the other actor's name, but he's in every Adam Sandler movie. Oh, oh, the, the, the guy with the Southern voice, Blake Clark. That's it. Stenchy the Clown? They're the ones who look <laughs> Yeah, they're the ones who look out for Shake. They're supposed to be going on work together, but Shake's always just getting drunk and laughing. And it's kind of easy to see. It's like his direction. Like he was hoping to get the show because the clown was retiring. He was hoping to get it, but Arch Nemesis got it. <laughs> yeah, it's all this competition <laughs> and, between these two clowns that hate each other's fucking guts. Because one is funny, but he's a disaster because he can't stop drinking. And then Binky isn't fucking funny, but he's an ass kisser and a manipulator. And Binky ends up getting it also because he sets up someone else for murder, or, or sets up Shakes for murder. And the movie has these scenes of desperation, pathetic behavior, but it's also just so ridiculous in the dialogue sometimes. Yeah. Like, um, I think the, uh, what was Tom Kenny's character's name? It was Binky. Yeah, Binky. But I remember his two lackeys were trying to insult Shakes, and Shakes was like, what the fuck? What are you talking about? Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> they, were coming up some of, they were taking some of the craziest, dumbest. Like, not even, like, even little kids will be like, what the fuck? Like, insults. <laughs> yeah, and, and most of the people oh, were friends. They had all been in stuff together, done stand-up together, so he was able to get a pretty strong cast of stand-up comedians and you know before they were stars like you know of course uh adam sandler but also you know we have a really strong cameo by robin williams as a mime <laughs> teacher <laughs> i love how he's just like straight up insulting bobcat the entire time he's trying to you know perform the mime the little mime actions and <laughs> critiquing him right then and there oh god i was I'm, i have to imagine you know, Bobcat, the entire time, trying to keep a straight face. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, can kind of see it in his face, like he's smirking a little. Yeah, it's almost a noir film, the way that it's shot and its tone, but there's just such silliness in this. But um, Bobcat was sick and tired of the same perform, you know, the same kind of stuff that he was doing, the screeching banshee kind of character that people had, uh, you know, discovered with um, uh, Police Academy. You know, and he started to go off a little bit with, like, Scrooge and Hot to Trot. But then he just took some time off and did this movie on his own. And sadly, it wasn't a hit, really. But it found its audience on video. But they pushed this thing on Comedy Central so fucking hard. You wonder how much it made in theaters? Oh, do tell. $114,000. Oh, my God. Yeah. But, you know, he's a director okay. now. He's a legitimate director now. He's done, like, ten movies, and he did a whole bunch of the Jimmy Kimmel show. So good for him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I have seen some movies like God Bless America, um, World's Greatest Dad, and there was another one he did. It was very recent, but I cannot remember for the life of me what it was. Well, there was a, there was a big one, yeah, no, I remember. Still... But, yeah, that's another thing I wanted to mention was that he's not using his screechy voice like he was known for he just, I mean, yeah, he would kind of flip out, you know, as he's putting on the clown persona. But then that was about it. And Julie Brown, you know, I, how she had that speech impediment the entire time, I'm like, oh, gosh. Well, that, she could, I mean, she's I, like again, a bowling champ, That right? is kind of hard to keep up or to keep on track with. Yeah. Like, 
considering to, you know, to have to perform the particular lines, remembering you can't say the R's right. You always have to say it with, with, a, with a, you know, with a W or something like that. Yeah, yeah. But she wasn't an idiot. She wasn't an idiot. Like her yeah. character wasn't some stereotypical moronic kind of girlfriend. A little naive, yeah. More than a little bit put upon. Yeah. The thing is, and then Shakes, of course, you know, being who he is. Ended up sleeping with Florence Henderson. Yeah, that was a bit of a surprise. This is Brady. <laughs> that was the, the promo. Very beginning. That is the promo they played on Comedy Central all the time. Is that scene? There used to be a TV show called Short Attention Span Theater, which was sketches and bits of stand up, but also promotions of upcoming movies. And this was one of them. They literally just show him like in the bathroom, waking up, getting peed on the head, <laughs> peed on the head, and then walking into Florence Henderson. <laughs> and that's how they tried to sell the movie. And I always thought that was a strange thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So again, I just love like some of the little gimmicks and the little uh, gags here and there. Like you know when he's just like checking his nose, like flexing it, like it's like honking on its own. <laughs> uh, the. Uh, but man, again. Sorry, everybody. I, I should <laughs> say this. This is how clowns are on the outside. Uh, like you know after afterward. Yeah, uh, Jacob, for our audience, I probably should have warned them ahead of time. My headphone jack, whatever the use thing I use for recording is broken on my phone, so I'm using a Bluetooth speaker, so there's overlap and long pauses, so I'm really sorry, everybody. I'm terribly sorry on my part. No, it's my part. I, you farted? Is that what you said? Uh, sorry for my fart? Oh, you're disgusting. I'm glad I can't smell through the speaker. Well, hey, luckily, there's no smell. Luckily, you know, smells can't travel through sound devices. So be thankful. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, no. There would probably be people passing out left and right like in 1989, you know, museum scene from Batman. <laughs> Speaking of stinky things, <laughs> the year 2009 was not very good for Amelia Estevez's character in Free Jack. You like that segue, fuckers? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, that's like that is not how 2009 was. Well, at all. <laughs> At all. That was a lie. That movie was a fucking lie. Well, we had a good president, so <laughs> that's why. Um, <laughs> this movie uh, is notorious with my friends because I made a bet January 17th of 1992 that Free Jack would be number one. I bet someone 10 bucks that it would be number one. And you know what beat it? <sighs> juice with Tupac. <laughs> fucking juice. <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, again, yeah, the way this played out, it was kind of like plenty of Hollywood action cliches. Amelia Estevez was trying to a little, I think. And of all the surprise, like, you know, casting Mick Jagger. Yeah, it's a bit, I think it's a bit gimmicky. I don't think it works. I think Mick is a little stiff. (laughs) But like when he's singing and dancing on, you know, you know, on stage performing with the Rolling Stones. Oh no, not at all. Yeah, it's so strange. It doesn't really work. down. Yeah, this movie was uh, riddled with production problems. It was rushed into production. They wanted it ready for fall of '91. They got the director of Young Guns 2, Jeff Murphy, to come back and team up with uh, Emilio. Linda Fiorentino oh, was originally okay. supposed to be his wife. She dropped out at the last minute. They got Rene Russo. Um, when they saw the uh, test audience reactions to the first cut, they hated it. They fucking hated it because it was almost all action and it was very, very dark. So they pulled it from the schedule and they reshot. They said they reshot 40% of it with a new director. Um, writer Ron. Oh, God. Yeah, Ron Chouchet was uh, the writer of Alien. And he came in to patch things up. And they lighten the tone. So a lot of the stuff that you see with dialogue and character pieces um, and in humor or whatever was added in later because either it was footage that was thrown away by the director or it was reshot. And I think the tone is a little bit better. Because if it's all violence, I don't think you're going to connect to the characters very well. No, Mike. It might as well have been like a freaking canon film. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Shit. Yeah. Oh man. It was wasn't that the case with um that one of that Chuck Norris movie where it's like post supposedly supposedly post apocalyptic and like there's just carnage out in the streets and he doesn't even say anything, he just kicks all their asses. Um was it Invasion America? 
I think it was that one. Invasion USA, I mean, I'm sorry. Where he just, like, a whole fucking neighborhood in Florida gets blown up by terrorists, and he just walks in, he doesn't say anything, he just starts mowing everybody down, everybody down with two Uzis in each hand. Because <laughs> Chuck Norris was not known for acting. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, honestly, like, Free Jack kind of sounded like that. Yeah, it, it apparently was very violent. So they went back in. I, I, I do like, I'm a huge Emilio fan anyway, and this is kind of during his heyday. Sadly, it wasn't a big hit. It wasn't as big as a flop as everybody uh, seems to think it was. Um, it made its money back with international sales, and it's it's a very interesting romp. If you haven't seen it, he's basically in the year 1992. He gets into an accident. There's this time lock machine where they can grab onto him um, and take him out of his time, and they bring him into the future. In the future, rich people can just buy bodies. They can just buy a body and have their brain patterns put in as a replacement. They've done a couple movies like that since then. What's that one with Ryan Reynolds, Selfless, I think? And uh, there's one with um, Kevin Costner called Criminal, but this was the first one. And I think there are some missed opportunities and there are some uh, flubs, I think, with some of the dialogue. Uh, but I think what they did with the patchwork, I, I, it was still pretty entertaining to me. Oh, yeah, no, of course, those particular concepts, definitely. Uh, again, yeah, and also, like, the after effect, like, now that he's, like, head of, like, one of the, you know, biggest corporations in the world, it's like he can actually, you know, dismantle and bring down all the class warfare. There's definitely themes of that throughout this movie, but they don't touch up on it. Yeah, there, like, that's an missed opportunity, but here's something minor. Do you, you know who uh, Grand L. Bush is, uh, the African-American actor that was helping him? Yes, the one who was eating, uh, the one who saw him come out of the river. Yeah, yeah, he knew exactly who Emilio Estevez's character was. Yeah, but he has a fucking samurai sword, and he doesn't have a fucking samurai battle. They blow it. He just stabs one dude. Oh, I'm like, no, oh. man, you sh you give him the goods. You let him go at him. Yeah, no, that's right. He only. Oh yes, him. That I will say was a missed opportunity. I'll, I thought you, I thought you said the other day, like. The one, remember when he was pulled out where he came out of the river after all that swimming and the guy eating the, eating the rat? Oh, you know? yeah. Okay, yes. I, I What is his name? I see him in everything. Um, Freaky Fights On. Thank you. Yeah, he's in all the uh, Hannibal Lecter movies. He's the only actor I think is in every single entry. And he's also the landlord of Coming to America. Oh, yeah. Speaking of, I watched the sequel. I absolutely fucking adored it. I have not watched it yet. I've yet to. I want to. Um, I think I can get it from. I can probably get it from Blu ray. Yeah, it's very good. I think it's right now. It's the most fun I've had watching a movie in a while. Yeah, no. I, I mean, I like I said here overall, it has some really great things. Uh, Mick Jagger is mm -hmm. kind of his main nemesis, and Anthony Hopkins is the guy who, you know, the big money guy. But, you know, we got the villain yeah, of Jonathan Banks him. is so greasy. <laughs> Jonathan Banks is a hell of a good villain. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, no. Who was the other guy? Uh, I keep forgetting his name, but I've seen him in Beverly Hills Cop. No, that's that's um, Jonathan Banks. I saw him. Which one? Jonathan Banks is the bad guy, the, the one, the bald yeah. guy. Uh, you're probably thinking of David Johansson. Do you remember him from Scrooge? He was, he's singing that song, doo doo, hot, hot, hot. <laughs> oh yes, Buster Poindexter. Yes, that was his alternate name when he was a lounge lizard kind of act. Yes, of course he was from New York Hall. Yeah. Did you did you ever see Oh, what was it? Car fifty four, where are you? Car fifty four, where are you? It sounds awfully familiar. I don't think I've seen it though. They used to play it on Comedy Central all the fucking time. It was originally supposed to be a musical from what I've read. And they cut all the musical numbers out of it, and they just dumped it into theaters. And I'm like, well, then why cast... Oh, never mind. You guys screwed this up so bad. <laughs> Dang, man. Yeah, no, this had quite a cast. I mean, Rosie O'Donnell, Fran Drescher, John McGinley, Missy Russell, Rosie O'Donnell, too. Yeah, you keep going. Uh, Jeremy Piven, Daniel Baldwin, uh, Al Lewis from the original Car 54, Where Are You? Um... I feel like oh, wow. there's somebody else in this. Uh, Tone Loke. Yeah, and it's just one of these movies that like... Ann Teller. Yeah, Orion just looked at it and said, oh shit, we spent too much money on this. Fucking throw it away. <laughs> oh, God. Bastard. 
Well, that's what happens mm. when you spend too much money. And I don't know how Orion Pictures blew all that fucking money from Dances with Wolves and Science of Lambs and just said, oh, we're bankrupt. Oopsie. Oh, my God. All right, final film? Final film, final film. Distinguished Gentlemen. I'm shocked oh, you haven't God. seen this before. This is one of my top five, easily top five Eddie Murphy movies. I fucking love this. Oh, no, dude. I seriously absolutely enjoyed all of it, too. I, <laughs> he, it's funny how it starts off. He's this con man at, like, a, at a political fundraiser, you know, with Sky's house, you know, pretending to be a waiter. They pretend to be a cop arresting him for, you know, on a little bus prostitution thing. Not only swindles him out of his money is, and his fucking Rolex. <laughs> I am Inga. Like, I am from like, Speed. You know, <laughs> come out with a plan to get involved in politics. Yeah. Well, it's classic Eddie Murphy. It's it's what he got away from for some years because uh, what was the last time he even was a fast talking? You know, uh, uh, Beverly Hills Cop two, maybe. Maybe yeah, Beverly Hills. Either Beverly Hills Cop two or uh, Trading Places. Yeah, it just seemed like it's, it's reflecting back on that era of Eddie Murphy because we had Coming to America, which is a completely different Eddie. Harlem Nights, which was hated by uh, critics and did very badly at the box office. Uh, Another 48 Hours, I think, is okay. I think it's better than the original when it comes to... It's a, repeat, a total repeat of the first movie. And so he, he, he decided to go off and he did Boomerang, which is a romantic comedy, which did okay. But then he decided for the first time in his career that he was leaving Paramount. He signs a huge deal with Disney. They give him a $15 million paycheck for this. And it doesn't oh, make the money. It just doesn't. It costs $50 million, and it only made 39 And, you know, he still had to complete his contract with Touchstone, um, which did not go well for him. He did Metro and uh, Holy Man, and all three bombed. And I just think this is the best of the bunch because he has a lot of heart. It's really smart. It's the first movie I, I can think of that really was blunt about politics. And it was smart that at no point do they ever mention a political party. No, not at all. Yeah, no, surprisingly, no, they didn't. Because I keep thinking... Of, but you know how the way they, you know the way they act. I'm like, oh, I know who they're talking about. Yeah. I know what they're doing. Well, I think <laughs> about the other political movie that James Garner made. Because James Garner isn't a very small cameo in this. He's the original Jeff Johnson. He dies. And Eddie Murphy <laughs> realized... It's the funniest fucking yeah. way. I mean, it was a happy ending. Yeah, oh, his, Eddie Murphy's <laughs> name is very similar. So he just uh, edits it and he finds his way to conning himself into office. But then he finds he has to actually be responsible, and I really love it. He gets justice on these guys so good. I think about every um, character actor that's known for being a sleazy white guy, and you got all of them in there. <laughs> but um, James oh, God, Garner yeah. did... Uh, the things they can pass. Oh. What was it? James Garner did um, My Fellow Americans with Jack Lemmon, which is another political movie. But in that one, they're very blunt with you know a Democrat and Republican. Exactly. Oh gosh, especially when it couldn't be, it started becoming far more clearer. Yeah, now it's it's yeah. absolutely clear. You, you there's, <laughs> we're, we've never been quiet about our politics, and let's just say I can't believe we're in a fucking state where I can't. The goddamn gaslighting, where they keep telling us that we our side is like, oh, you're communist, you're trying to take everybody's rights away, as they are taking away everybody's <laughs> rights. I can't believe that we're. But, <laughs> I know. South Carolina is trying to ba uh, the Republican Party is trying to pass a bill to make it illegal to have websites that show you how to go get an abortion. That's a violation of the First Amendment, and yet that all they talk about is how we want to cancel everything. It drives me up the. I know, and it's like uh, projecting much. Yeah, but in this movie, <laughs> Eddie Murphy care. is the only thing they ever say is that he's independent, so that he can be an outsider to all of this. But a lot of it is about exactly. the sleazy, back dealing, double you know, double agent kind of horseshit, and about how much you get paid off if you want to be on this committee. If you want to be, you know, if you want this, you have to pay off this. If you want that, you have to be quiet about this. And um, yeah, it's it, when he finally gets uh, uh, a revenge on all these fucking assholes. It's it's sweet. Yeah, I know, absolutely. And especially for the small town he was at, was trying to get his attention about all the power lines, you know, like, 
I guess we're causing, you know, hair loss in children, like near near the playgrounds and stuff, and nobody was ever done anything about it. I'm always and he finally ends up doing something about it after that. I'm always bummed that the writer of this really didn't go anywhere after this because he had three bombs right in a row and his career was over with. You want to know what those three movies were? This. Noises Off was his first. Right? And then a third one was Striking Distance with Bruce Willis. And uh, I, don't, I have no idea what ever happened to his career. No idea. That is a bummer because, again, I think like, some of the most clever dialogue I feel like came from him. Yeah, it sucks. I'm looking, I'm looking at this right now, and after all three of those movies, he went and was an assistant on like a dozen directed video movies over a two-year period of time and then just disappeared. Ugh, this is a shame. Yes, it is. But, um, yeah, this is one that critics hated it. Audiences forgot about it, and Disney has thrown it away. And that's what sucks, because it's not on Blu-ray, it's not available on digital, there's a copy of it on YouTube, and there is a DVD somewhere out there you can still get. That's it, if, if you want. Oh, wow. Yeah, damn. Okay. No, it kind of makes sense, yeah. especially if like, it didn't do as well, that would happen. Yeah. All right, so that is it for the year of 1992. Jacob, thank you very much. We're going to take a small break and come back with 1993 in about a month. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Jacob, send us out. All right. Now I'm saying good luck, everybody. Be excellent to each other. And party on, dudes. Every time I redline on that, every single time I redline, <laughs> I'm going to get away from the mic when I do that. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs>